And we come week by week and we sing and we worship God and we sing songs that are about his greatness, his faithfulness, the things that he does. And those things are, are good for us to voice our praise to God and to acknowledge him and to give him glory. But they're good for us too. They're good to remind us about who he is and what he's done, what he's capable of doing, the things that he's promised. It gives us reassurance. Reassurance. Anybody ever need some reassurance? I mean, all of us have had occasions in our life when we were making a big decision or a big choice, right? Something that was a major life change. We were about to invest ourselves into something for the future, and you don't know what the outcome's going to be. You're making choices about maybe how to invest fun, funds or money or how to invest your life or whether to make a move across the country or whether to, you know, make some other significant change, and you just don't know. You need some reassurance. Sometimes things change on you in the middle and you, you need some reassurance that the path that you chose, this really is the right thing, even though maybe it's not going the way I thought it was going to go, this is still the right thing. We need reassurance, right? There are times that we, we face that and we need that challenge. And we're moving along in the story of the Gospels, looking at the good news, the message of the Gospel that we have in Jesus Christ. And as we're rapidly moving towards kind of the climax of the story of what Jesus came for, what he came to do in his first incarnation as he came and put on skin and walked among us, we're walking up to a time when his disciples are about to, in a way, have the rug pulled out from under them. You know, what they think is, is not the way it's going to be. Even though Jesus has been trying to tell them, he's been trying to prepare them, he's foreshadowed the things that are coming, things are about to go through a significant change and it's going to rock their world. It's going to shake them to the core. And, you know, in difficult times, all of us need a little reassurance. Sometimes the events of life can, can shake us to our core and we need something to hold on to and something to give us direction, someone to help us know it's all going to be okay. It's all still going to work out. It's all right we're we're in the right place and i'm amazed at jesus walking through this when you think about the weight of what he was carrying in himself i think about jesus and his humanity and he's carrying the weight of what he's going to do for all of us what he's going to go through he knows what's ahead he makes that clear time and time again and in the middle of carrying all that he continues to think about what his disciples need what we need the reassurance that they need to provide for them I don't do so well at that. You know, there's times that my wife, my family depend on me for reassurance and under the weight of what I'm carrying, I don't feel as prepared to, you know, maybe take care of what they need in that moment. I'm kind of like, hey, you know, I kind of need something here. And yet I see in Jesus this example to provide for them that reassurance that they need it. And it's beautiful in what he does. And Jesus' final night with his disciples, is, that's where we've come to in the story, his, his final night with them before his suffering was filled with reassurance. Reassurance for them and reassurance for us as well in our faith in him. And in the final hours that he spent with them, he demonstrated servanthood his knowledge of things to come. He gave direction. He gave encouragement. He gave them empowerment as well as hope. And his words and his prayer ring true for us today just as much as they did for those first disciples so long ago. We have the reassurance that we need and it's good news. It's good news. Let's dive into this today. We're going to hang out in John's gospel. Uh, the different gospels tell of the, the events coming towards the final Passover that Jesus shared with his disciples. But John is the one that tells us the story at length. About four chapters of his gospel tell of the events of that evening and Jesus' conversation with his disciples. And so we're going to hang out there for a little bit this morning. Beginning in John chapter 13 and verse 1, it says, Now before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper... When the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet. And to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. 
We begin to look into this last night that Jesus spent with his disciples and pretty quick off the bat, it's not maybe what we would have expected. If we had known in that moment all that was ahead, if we had been looking for what was going to happen, we probably would have thought different. And yet we find Jesus, like I say, giving of himself yet again and providing for his disciples and providing that reassurance that they need and reassuring them through his own example. Putting teaching into practice. Here's someone on the verge of what he's about to do. And as this scripture makes so plain to us, he knows what's ahead. He knows that the time is here. and might be overwhelmed with his own need for reassurance, for comfort, for someone to come alongside him and be there to support him. And yet we find him taking that supporting role. He told them that the greatest among them should be like the youngest and a servant. And that's absolutely what he practiced. According to Luke's version of this, in Luke 22, verses 7 through 13, it tells us that Jesus had sent Peter and John to prepare the Passover meal for them to share. In fact, I love how Luke tells the story on on a couple of occasions. One, the triumphal entry. He says, I want you to go into the city and you'll find this donkey tied up there and you can go get it. And Somebody's going to be like, what are you doing? And tell them, well, the master needs it. And they'll say, okay, that's fine. On this occasion in Luke 22, he says, I want you to go into the city and you're going to find this guy and you follow him home and he's going to have a room all prepared for the Passover, but not for him. And you're going to say, where's the room that the the master needs to have his Passover? And he's going to say, here it is. Stuff that we just read over and it's like, you realize what that is? You know, when was the last time you prepared a room in your house for a guest? You didn't know who it was that was coming and they walked up and said, it's me. And you said, here you go. Right. And yet that's what's going on. But he sends Peter and John and he tells them, I want you to go and prepare for our Passover meal. Jesus celebrated the festivals and the feasts during his his time, and and this was one of them. He celebrated the Passover time and again. But here as he draws towards the time of his sacrifice, he's preparing for that meal to share with them. The room was provided, but the point I really want you to catch here was that they were making those preparations. The room was there, but he'd sent Peter and John to get ready. And when the time came, they were together for the meal. They gathered as they would, Jesus at the head of the table like a father in a household and the others around next to him. And we get some idea of their placement when it talks about John being the one that leaned back against him, that he's the one right next to him at the table and the others are in some of the other positions around there. And we we get the idea of what's going on. But when they, they came, they're all gathered for the meal. But because this was a borrowed room and they had made the preparations, there were no servants there attending them. And what we see is they've come in from the street as their habit and their custom would have been to come into the house. And if you were a guest in the house, there would have been water provided and you would have stopped for a moment and they would have rinsed the dust off of your feet. And then you were clean to come in and recline at the table and participate in dinner. And no one wanted to take on that task and accept the role of being the servant, the least of these. They're all gathering in. They all know the custom. They all know the habit. They're all like, hmm, nobody here. Guess I'll wait. And so we find Jesus gets up as the food is now prepared and on the table. It's past the point this should have been done. Nobody's taken the opportunity. Jesus gets up from the table, from the head of the table, and goes, takes off his outer robe, takes the towel, wraps it around him, gets the water, and begins to go around and wash their feet and drives home a lesson they would not soon forget. He didn't do it to condemn them. He didn't do it to shame them. In fact, none of his words present the idea of shaming them. How come one of you guys didn't do this? You know, Which one of you is going to get up and get with it? But he goes around and he begins to share with them. And we read through the rest of those verses as he begins to go and wash them. I'm sure they were greatly humbled at that as he came around to them. In fact, Peter's like, no, you're, you're not going to wash my feet. And he says, Peter, if I don't wash you, you have no part with me. You don't understand this is more than somebody missing the moment of where they could have done something. There's more to it. And Peter being the the overzealous guy that he is, well, not just my feet, how about my hands and my head, you know? And he's like, no, 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 Peter, just relax. He goes around and he washes their feet, and when he gets done, he just comes back to his place at the table, puts his robe back on, and comes to the head of the table back to lead their meal 
And he just begins to ask them, do you understand what I've done for you? I didn't do it to shame you, but I did it to show you that what I prize and what I value and what marks a great leader in the kingdom is somebody who is willing to serve. You call me teacher. You call me master. You look at me, at me as the most respected one. And in our custom, not unlike ours today, somebody that becomes the master, somebody that becomes the teacher, well, they don't, they don't do the menial thing right? They, there's somebody else to do that. They get waited on. They get, you know, they get to sit back and he says, no, I want to show you something different. You call me master. You call me teacher. You call me Lord. And yet I'm happy to serve you, to take care of you, to meet your needs. And so he begins to show them and, and remind them that greatness in the kingdom is reflected in humbleness and in servanthood in love and compassion and taking care of someone else. And the beauty in doing that was also the idea that anyone can be great in the kingdom. And we probably all had things that we aspired to that we wanted to be great at. You know, I want to be a great musician. You know, I want to, I want to be a great athlete. I want to be a great business person. I want to be a great writer. I want to be a great whatever and maybe we had the skill set for that, and maybe we didn't. Maybe we had a capacity for that, and maybe we didn't. And maybe we've struggled to find, you know, those things that we're good at. Can I tell you, everybody has the opportunity for greatness in the kingdom. Because it's our heart, the humility of our heart, and our willingness to serve. And Jesus says that what, is what makes someone great in the kingdom. And it's reassurance that we belong, and that we have a place, and that we have something it's a reassurance of the things that he taught was not about finding your place in the pecking order, not about scratching and clawing your way to the top, not about trying to demonstrate that you're better than someone else, but receiving the grace and the love of God and turning around and sharing it with someone else. He brings the reassurance through his own example. And he goes on as he comes back to the table with them, having explained this. It says, after saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and he testified, Truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. They all begin to ask. And he says, Jesus answered, it is he to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. So when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Then after he had taken the morsel... Satan entered into him, and Jesus said to him, what you're going to do, do quickly. Scripture goes on to tell us that they didn't really understand what was happening in this moment and where Judas was going when all of a sudden he got up and left the room and they figured that Jesus sent him on an errand since he was the keeper of the bag and had the money. And they don't realize quite what's going on, and yet again, Jesus is telling them about what's going to happen. And what he's doing is reassuring them through foretelling. He's reassuring them through foretelling. We're actually going to venture through three different things here that he foretells in this moment. The first is his betrayal. Someone at the table with me is going to betray me. Not to belittle the moment, but it sounds like an intriguing story we might find in a book or a movie, right? You know, you sit down and they're at the dinner table. Someone at this table is going to betray me. And everybody's like, what? The intrigue begins, you know. They did capture the idea when he first said it that he said, they all begin asking, well, who is it? And then he tells them, it's the one I'm going to give this piece of bread to. And yet when he does and when Judas leaves, they still somehow kind of miss it. You know, one of the things I think is amazing in this moment is when it happens in the events of the evening because Jesus had just washed his betrayer's feet, knowing full well who it was. You know, Jesus is never taken by surprise. I never get tired of saying that. God is never taken by surprise. Jesus is never taken by surprise. You can blow me out of the water. You could sideswipe me with something I didn't see coming. I had no idea. I can be totally devastated in the moment because I didn't expect this. But you can never take God by surprise. And I find great confidence in that and being able to lean on him and trust him that if we're looking for his guidance and direction, it doesn't matter if I got blown away. I just need to settle down and pray and find his direction for me in the moment because he's not surprised. And I can have peace in that and confidence in knowing that he's got direction for me. 
but he's never taken by surprise and he wanted them to know it. He wanted them to know that the events that were about to happen were not a shock to him. They were not a surprise. They were not a change in course. They weren't a reversal of God's plan. They weren't an interruption, you know, of what the enemy had done to ruin God's plan. So he tells them, one of you, in fact, is going to betray me. In fact, what we see in this moment is that it's so much not an interruption. It was he who chose the timing and put into motion the sequence of events that would lead to his arrest, his trial, and his death. It's already been in Judah's heart. He's already been in conversation with them. It's already going on. Jesus knows that. But it's Jesus who releases him at that moment. What you're going to do, go do it. And go do it now. And sets the clock in motion. For him to go and find the people that he's going to bring back to the garden where he knows they're headed after dinner to go and pray to come and find him there. Jesus is not taken by surprise. He set the timing into motion. At the same time, I think his heart was very heavy for Judas. It goes on in verse 31 it says when Judas had gone out Jesus said now is the son of man glorified and God is glorified in him if God is glorified in him God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once little children yet a little while I am with you you will seek me and just as I said to the Jews so now I also say to you where I am going you cannot come a new commandment I give you that you love one another just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. See, as he was speaking about those things that were to come, he also spoke about his departure. He knew what was getting ready to happen. He knew the time had come. His time of ministry, his time with these disciples that he's invested in for the past three years, all these things, they're coming to a close. The time of his suffering is at hand. Judas goes out and he continues to share with them what was about to happen. And at the moment, they didn't understand, but he's sharing it with them because later they're going to remember. And he wants them to find the reassurance. You know, he told us this. He told us ahead of time. You remember what he said? He spoke about it before it happened. He's providing them the reassurance that they need to keep the faith, to continue to believe in him. What he was doing, what he had been doing, was an act of love. And what he wanted them to capture and emulate was the love that they should have as well love for each other the subject that he revisits in this conversation with them that night but it's especially important as he begins to talk about one who would betray him and he's about to speak of another who would deny him very easy for that group to fracture and fall apart into infighting and accusations and blame and all the things that would go along and they need to remember his command that they're not to blame each other but to love each other and to carry on just as he's instructed them to. Something they would have to hold on to and remember in another moment. Verses 37 and 38 finish out this section. As it says, Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. And Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. And in the course of this dinner, as they'd shared the Passover before, and I'm sure as they came together to share the Passover, all their expectations, this is not the dinner conversation they'd expected to have. It was expected that whoever was at the head of the table, the father, whoever was in that role would bring teaching, bring something of importance, bring a discussion topic to the table that would be of value and importance for them all, as well as the celebration of the Passover. And they had no idea what it would be, but Jesus used this moment to impart some very, very important things to them. 
He's spoken about his betrayal. He's spoken about his departure. And he also speaks of a denial. In the moment, this was as difficult to imagine for them, I think, as that one of them would betray him. One of us would deny you? We've been with you all this time. We've been with you through all these things. And yet again, as shocking as it is, there's reassurance in the fact that he knows and it's still going to be okay. One of the other gospel stories tells us that he tells Peter, I've prayed for you, Peter. Satan wants to sift you like wheat, but I've prayed for you. And he said, I want you to hear me because after this has happened, I want you to turn around and I want you to support your brother. It's okay. This is going to happen, but it's okay. And I'm telling you now because this is one of those things that would shake you to your core and make you want to quit. Make you want to turn around and go the other way, but I'm telling you, it's going to be okay. And so he provides the reassurance to them through foretelling and describing to them those things that would happen. You know, that's probably one of those things we look to to validate someone. If someone could tell us the future, if someone could lay out for us the way things are going to be, if somebody's a true prophet, then we would be inclined to believe them. Well, certainly Jesus evidenced that as he gave them things they needed to know in order to strengthen them in their hearts for the moments that were ahead. And then he begins to speak some words of peace. John 14, beginning in verse 1, a very familiar passage. We often hear it used at funerals and occasions like it. But he begins speaking, he says, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. You know the way to where I am going. They begin to ask, how would we know? And he, he says to them, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Begin reassuring them through hope. Offering a glimpse of things to come, not the negative things they would face in the short term, but the beautiful things that are in the long term of God's plan for them. Jesus began to paint a picture of better things ahead. And he gave reassurance that God's plan will prevail. They're about to feel like their whole world is being turned upside down. That the person that they've trusted in, that they followed, has been taken away from them. That what do we do now? It, it, it's over. It's blown up. It's blown apart. But he's saying, no, 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 no. The plan of God is still intact, and here's what you're looking forward to. And what I'm doing, in fact, is preparing what's waiting for you. Those things that I promised you, they're still true. Those things that I have pointed you towards, those are still there. They're going to be there. And he gave assurance that God's plan would indeed prevail. He was letting them know that what he, ha he started in them, what he has started with them, and in them, it, it's going to continue. Hold on. Stay with me. Hold fast. And he tells them that they're not going to be left alone, even as he's speaking these words about his departure and going away. But he tells them, I'm not going to leave you alone. You're going to have another helper. When I go, the Holy Spirit is going to come. He's going to be with you. He's going to be in you. He's going to remind you of the things that I've taught you. He's going to help you to know what to do. And he begins speaking to them about the importance of obedience and how, in fact, his obedience is the fulfilling of God's plan. Hope. They're going to need it. We all need it. We go through times of difficulty and struggle and all those things that we've trusted in and felt so certain about, we begin to, to waver on as it's not what I thought it would be. It's not what I expected. And he's telling us, hold on, hold on. This would be important reassurance in the hours and days ahead. The moments that were coming when they'd all be scattered, when they'd be hiding out for fear, and they'd be uncertain of what had happened and what was going to happen next. 
He goes on in what we recognize in John 15, and he begins to teach. He says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. He went on to remind them, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. And again he refers to their obedience as he says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. And he reminds them again, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. He begins reassuring them through instruction, helping them know what to do. The moments ahead are going to cause confusion and distress wondering about what to do and how to react. And for most of us, when we get surprised and shocked, and if something like this happened, I think our first reaction would be anger, aggressiveness, violence. Not unlike we'll see Peter in the garden when they come to arrest him and he takes a sword and cuts off someone's ear. our, Our natural reaction would be aggression, and yet Jesus keeps speaking about love. Begins to give instructions as to what they need to do. Keep your heads. Here's the direction. Here's what I want you to do. Here's how I want you to respond. Here's how I want you to go forward from these moments. And he gives a beautiful image of of their connection and our connection with him as he tells the story about the vine. He speaks of his father as the one that's taking care of the vineyard, but he says, I'm the vine, and your branches that are connected to me, you draw life and nutrients and wholeness and wellness from me, and because of what's coming from me, you produce fruit in your life. But he says, we're connected. You're alive because you're a part with me. You're a part of me. And he says, I want you to stay connected to that. This is life. You've come to see that. You've recognized who I am. You're alive because of your connection to me. Hold on to it and be fruitful. And it's reassuring to know that we aren't left to do it on our own. I think we quite often view things that way, and we can even view our faith that way, that, okay, we've, we've found the grace of God. We've found salvation. Now I've, got to, now I've got to get up and go out there and prove to God that I was worth saving. Good luck. We don't do it on our own. It's the grace of God in us. It's staying connected to that vine. We don't prove something to God. We live life in Him. And we've not been left to do it on our own, but He provides what we need. And continues to grow us. And to be at work in us and through us. And it's reassuring to know that we are loved completely by Him. And His command is that we would share that same love with each other. That we would demonstrate it even to those opposed to us, that it would be the mark to define us as his disciples. That we've received love like no other, somebody who was willing to give up their very life for us with the hope that we would begin to pass that love and pay it forward and share it with others. As long as he is speaking, you know, John 16, he makes a statement that to me was kind of the, the preparation for this whole concept today. In John 16, 1, he says, I've said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. The reassurance. We all need reassurance. And he was ready to provide it. And he offers one other reassurance that I want you to see today. In these final hours, as he's been speaking to them right before he came to the the telling about the vine, they left the room that they'd been spending the time in. And as they're journeying towards the garden where they're going to pray, he's telling that story to them and sharing with them. 
And in John 17, we begin to read about how he prayed for them. It begins by telling us, when Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. He went on to say, I'm praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you've given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you've given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. He went on to say, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. He said also, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Reassuring them through prayer, praying for us. We have an intercessor. I don't know about you, but I think that's a good thing. I find it reassuring to know that people have been praying for me. Have you ever had somebody tell you that sometime and then they're like, I'm praying for you. I don't know how that makes you feel. I appreciate that. You know, it, there are moments too that you're like, wow, God touched somebody's heart to pray for me and they had no idea what's going on. They're praying for you. And you have the confidence that when someone's praying for you that, you know, God's hearing not just from you but from someone else and, uh, about your situation and, and responding to that. They're praying for you. How much more to know that Jesus prayed and continues to pray for us. Do you think about that? It says that Jesus, part of what he does as he's at the Father's right hand is that he intercedes for us. He prays for us. Jesus himself prays for you. Praise for your well-being. Praise for what's going on. Praise for God's will to be done in you and through you. And he prayed for us some interesting things. If you notice out of the things that we pulled out of that passage, if you go back and read through it, some of the things he prayed for us might not be the first things we would think to pray for ourselves, but they're the things that he was concerned about for us. He prayed that we would know the truth. He prayed that God would watch over and keep us in the middle of the things that we went through. Interesting that he didn't pray that we'd be taken away from all those things, but that God would be with us and that he would see us through them. He prayed that we would be in unity. I think we miss the importance of that. That we would be in unity with him and with each other. He prayed that the Father would protect us from our enemy. Prayed that he would sanctify us in the truth. He prayed that we would see and dwell in his glory. And it's reassuring to know that God is for us, isn't it? I think we probably all go through those moments knowing ourselves as we do that we wonder, is God really for me? Could God really be for me? Would I be for me? God's for you. He loves us, and he cares for us, and he wants good things for us, and he's at work on our behalf, and Jesus is interceding that the Father would continue to bless us and to be for us. That's reassuring. Jesus was so very deliberate about his final hours with his disciples. I love these passages of Scripture, these, these four chapters that you can read across that talk about that night and the communication that he had with them. We draw things from the other uh, gospel stories about it also, but he's so deliberate as to how he spends his time with them and what he wants to share with them before his own suffering. Again, so much that must have been on his mind that he was going to walk through and face, and yet he's walking them through the moments ahead of them. The things that would transpire in the coming hours and days would, would shake them to the core. Fear. 
uncertainty, just chaos in their life and what's going on. And he wanted to reassure them of who he is and, and what he taught and what he was accomplishing for all of us and that this is not the end, it's just the beginning. And I think looking down through the ages as he made the point that I'm not just praying for them, but I'm praying for all the ones that are going to believe because of the story they're going to share. He was looking at us. And he wanted us to know too and to know exactly what was going on in his concern for us. He wanted us to look back and see that he knew exactly what it was going to look like even though it was beyond human comprehension and imagination. And he wanted to reassure us that he was making it possible for us to receive the good news. Just a final thought on this today. Again, I don't know what the situations are that you, you're facing or where you feel in your faith. Uh, I'm watching people be very challenged by what's going on in our world today, in our country today. And they, they seem to wonder, God, how could you let this happen? That's like always the question, right? That's the question everybody has. God, how could you let these things happen? And it shakes us to our core sometimes. Things happen that we don't expect, that we don't think they should happen that way. And when where is God in all of this? That's the kind of moments the disciples were about to go through. Jesus provides the reassurance that we need. We don't have to be shaken to our core. We don't have to be knocked off balance. We don't have to be sent spiraling out somewhere to be recovered back. We need to lean into him and hold on to the reassurance that he provides. And in your situation today, in whatever challenges you may be facing, whatever changes in life, whatever situations are going on, whatever things you're dealing with that you didn't expect, Know that God is not taken by surprise, that he is for you, that he has plans for your good, and hold tightly to him. And just allow him to show you the next step, the next step in the journey, the next step in the path. Hold on to what you know. Hold on to the truth of what you've received. Hold on to your trust in him. This all centered that night around them sharing the Passover together, communion, and we're going to share communion together. If there's anyone that has kids that you want to be in with us to take communion, you can go and get them and bring them in. We're going to take communion together in just a moment. But I want to, I want to pray with you this morning over this message and over our communion together. You know, again, in Luke's version of this story in Luke 22, Jesus, it says in verse 15, he said to them, I've eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. He wanted to have that moment. He was looking forward to celebrating this Passover with them. He's been celebrating Passover with them year by year, I think. But he came in this moment. He said, I've eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you. He knew the things that were on his heart to share. He knew what was about to happen. He knew that it was the fulfillment. And he wanted them to see all of what God was doing. If you've been a part of our Passover Seder celebrations, you're aware of the symbolism in the Passover and how Jesus identified himself with it. In the elements on the table of where we're going to take communion today, we see those same things. We see the, the cup and the bread. There was a meal that they shared together, but at different points in the meal, they took the cup. Luke is very deliberate about telling us what happened in what we recognize as communion. As he tells us plainly that it was after the supper, he took a piece of bread. It's a piece of bread that's broken and hidden away and comes back like Jesus being buried in the grave and coming back after three days and he breaks it apart and he says, take it and, and eat this. And he said, I want you to see something new. I want you to see my body. This is me being broken for you. And he took that specific piece so that they would remember and they would know. And, and so this, this thing on the table as he broke it so familiar to them, as they would partake of it time and again together, he said, this is me. Remember what I've done for you. And again, with it being after the supper, he took the cup, and the cup was the cup of redemption, the cup of salvation, and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood that's being poured out for you. I'm dying for you so that your sins can be forgiven. You can be made right with God. You can be in God's presence forever. We can be together all. So he said, I don't want you to see these things the same anymore. I've desired to eat this Passover with you that you would understand what I'm about to do. And it's what we celebrate still today. It's a little separated from the dinner together, but we see these things and we're reminded. His body broken for us, his blood poured out for us. 
that we might have that relationship with him. This again is the reassurance of all that God has promised. It's already done. He's already won the victory for us. And he just instructs us to hold tightly to him. Let me pray with you this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the good news. And Lord, in the middle of the good news, it didn't mean everything was sweet and beautiful. There were difficult moments. There were struggles from the opposition that, that you faced, Lord, to the suffering that you had to go through for us. Lord, to the betrayal, to the denial, even from those closest to you. And yet in all of that, you were working out salvation for us freedom from sin, the opportunity to have life with you forever. God, may we see that though your plan takes turns and directions we could not imagine or begin to understand until we begin to look at them after the fact, Lord, may we be encouraged to trust in you in the moment. That your plan is at work, that it's for our good, that we just need to hold tightly to you. May we find that reassurance and all that we know about you, all that we've seen of you, your words, your prayers for us. God, may we hold that reassurance. God, may we celebrate that again today as we participate in communion. As we come and take of the bread and the cup today, we be, may we be reminded of how deeply you've loved us. What you've done for us. That your, your sacrifice is complete, the victory is won, and nothing can change that. God, we have hope today. We have good news because of you and what you've done. We thank you for it in Jesus' name.